Tips. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We turn now to Libya, where at least four people died in heavy shelling on Tuesday in the capital city of Tripoli. According to the United Nations, over 170 people have been killed and 750 injured since a Libyan warlord launched an assault on Tripoli on April 5th. The fighting pits the U.N.-backed Government of National Accord against a militia led by former Libyan general Khalifa Haftar, who already controls much of eastern Libya. The Libyan government has accused the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia and Egypt of funding and arming Haftar, who has dual U.S.-Libyan citizenship. Meanwhile, Qatar has called for the enforcement of an arms embargo against Haftar. Libyans have taken to the streets to protest the escalating violence. There is a, a troop invasion of Tripoli from uh, Haftar and his uh, military. Uh, they were starting uh, to attack the capital of Libya, Tripoli and the government of National Accord, the legitimate government of Libya. Uh, this has uh, happened around 13 years days ago. Uh, today, uh, the position of the government is very clear. Uh, this is a coup, and uh, he has to go back with his troop to where he was before this all happening. That's Libyan Deputy Prime Minister Ahmed Metig. The fightings displaced nearly 18,000 people, but authorities fear the humanitarian crisis could quickly escalate if the fighting continues. Human rights groups are also sounding the alarm over the safety of the many migrants and refugees who pass through Libya, thousands of whom are currently in migrant prisons. Libya has been plagued by factional fighting since a U.S.-led NATO intervention in 2011 toppled longtime authoritarian leader Muammar Gaddafi. To talk more about the escalating violence, we go now to London to speak with Libya political analyst Enes Elgomati, um, director of the Tripoli-based Sadek Institute, Libya's first independent research organization. Welcome to Democracy Now! For people who have no idea Thank about you, what's Amy. going on in Libya, can you explain what exactly is taking place? Who is Haftar? What is the UN-backed government? What's happening? Why are people dying? There has been, uh, since the overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi in 2011, there have been at least three or four instances like this. Uh, the first was in 2014, uh, when the country effectively split in two. There were two rival parliaments, there were two rival governments, uh, but effectively it was launched by Khalifa Haftar on May 15, 2014, when he uh, launched a counterterrorism operation, which was effectively a thinly veiled uh, attempt at a coup. He'd already launched the coup two months before that on February 14th uh, and had just rephrased it and uh, kind of repackaged it, and it's still kind of ongoing. He took into a foothold in Benghazi in eastern Libya, where he acquired territory through military support delivered from the UAE and France over the last couple of years and has been moving swiftly across the country. Uh, in February, he was uh, allegedly going to cut a deal with this new UN-backed government that only came into existence after a UN-negotiated dialogue over two and, two and a half years between 2014 and 16, which was supposed to deliver a consensus government. Now, the prime minister of that government, Faya Saraj, is not of any of the two rival factions that began fighting in 2014. He's an MP from uh, a member of parliament that was elected in Tripoli in 2014 with around 3,000 votes, so effectively no skin in the game, uh, but has become Haftar's kind of punching bag over the last two years and was almost going to uh, agree to a deal to allow Haftar to take control of the Libyan National Army to acquire the international recognition that Faya Saraj and the UN-backed government actually uh, um, have acquired from the UN over the last couple of years. Um, and then that deal went wrong last month during a visit by Antonio Guterres, the, the chief of the UN, when Haftar launched the, an offensive in Tripoli two weeks ago. Uh, and since then, the fighting has been kind of catastrophic. But to paint a very easy picture here, you have two kind of factions. You have those that believe in uh, creating a civilian-backed government, a democratic one, a pluralist kind of nation, that are the kind of adhere to the ideals of the revolution that many of Libyans came around in 2011 to support and defend against the return of military rule. And you have Khalifa Haftar that is trying to, um, at least in some way, recreate that rule that had gone on to Libya for 42 years and is trying to bend the will of those that exist and, and live in the most densely, part, uh, densely populated part of Libya. 2.7 million people live in Western Libya. And effectively, this, off this offensive is launched against them. So it's, it's been a very, very nasty couple of years. But this is just one chapter in a very, very long series of chapters uh, in Libya's civil war. Mm.
Well, could you talk about uh, the role of France? Because France is obviously uh, has been backing Haftar along with the UAE, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. Uh, why is France uh, backing him? I think for many states, they have, I mean, let's not get into altruism here, but many states have their own very narrow uh, interests. I think in terms of France, this is consistent um, with a joint alliance that they've launched with the UAE, with Egypt, with, uh, with Saudi Arabia. So MBS, effectively, MBZ, Mohammed bin Zayed in the UAE, and President Sisi, this new kind of uh, this new club of autocrats that have emerged in the, uh, since the Arab Spring over the last couple of years, they've aligned themselves to, the, to those autocrats for a variety of reasons. I mean, in terms of commercial interest in Libya, France stands to benefit through uh, its relationship with Tatao in trying to get concessions through Khalifa Haftar. The idea that you can negotiate with one man is often a much more simple relationship or simpler relationship than negotiating with an elected government that may change after a couple of years. But it also comes down to a very uh, an ideological narrative that has been um, not only that is being propagated in Libya, but is being propagated throughout the Arab world by the UAE, which tries to paint all forms of political opposition, political dissidence, civil society participation as, as Salafi jihadi, as, as terrorism. And that war on terrorism is really a thinly veiled attempt at returning the Arab world to autocratic rule and trying to maintain this status quo, create these kind of neo-patrimonial relationships where you have a client state and you have very, very narrow interests amongst a very narrow club of, of, of individuals who can then go on to deliver your, um, your strategic interests um, through a click of a button, from, from distance, through, through proxy. So I think in that respect, France is part of a wider club. It's what, part of a wider alliance. But it's certainly one that has found footing over the last couple of years by reorientating a war on terror na uh, narrative that has been around since 2001, but giving it an Arab dialect, and one that really is just a thinly veiled attempt at returning the Arab world to autocratic rule. And could you talk about the role of Eric Prince and uh, the uh, and his former uh, mercenary organization Blackwater uh, mm -hmm. in uh, in Libya? Well, it's really the UAE's role that is behind this. I think in 2010, um, the UAE Mohammed bin Zayed uh, uh, gave over half a billion dollars to the Frontier Service Group, which is um, which is now led by Eric Prince, formerly of Blackwater. Um, and since then, allegedly, according to um, uh, to Western uh, print media. Uh, Eric Prince, alongside the UAE, established an air base, a military base, a drone base in eastern Libya between 2014 and 16. Now, this is well documented by the uh, UN panel of, uh, of experts and the Security Council, where the year that Libya was supposed to be delivered an enduring peace, a sustainable peace, a concession by both sides in the civil war in 2016, when they announced the beginning of this new chapter in Libya's history and, and delivered this piece, uh, this government of national accord in Tripoli, was the very year that the UAE violated the arms embargo in Libya in unprecedented levels, but also began to establish the final touches and final pieces of this air base in eastern Libya called Al Khadim. Now, it possesses a massive arsenal of drones, wing loons, which are pri uh, Chinese kind of mimics and, uh, of, the, of the American Predator F-1 drone, but it also ha uh, houses at least uh, two air tractors, which are kind of industrial um, uh, industrial kind of aircraft that have been kitted out with, uh, uh, with air-to-surface air air missiles, and at the very least, this kind of move, I mean, it's very, very difficult to pin down, so that's why I'm using the word alleged, because I don't want to get sued. But at the very least, there have been uh, many, many investigations that have pinned this to Eric Prince's uh, Frontier Service Group. At least in the last two years, those, uh, that arsenal of, of, of drones and, and air tractors have been used to support Khalifa Haftar's ground offensives in Benghazi and in Derna that have displaced around 100,000 people in Benghazi, but have also led to 1,700 people being imprisoned in Derna. And many of those uh, 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 ground invasions, many of those military assaults are now being investigated by the ICC for war crimes. So I think it's that kind of tacit uh, and underlying kind of discrete military assistance that the UAE provided, that the French provided in Benghazi, that has not only bolstered Khalifa Haftar in the east of the country, but has been the, the, pr the platform and the pretext for this latest offensive in Tripoli. And we should remind ourselves that this was done in the eyes and in the presence of Antonio Guterres, the chief of the UN. And it wasn't a mistake. It wasn't anything that was uh, down to kind of a, an absence of timing. It was timed to coincide with his trip, and it was timed to alert by Khalifa Haftar his political and military opponents and much of, uh, of the population that is dissatisfied and does not want to return to military rule to indicate to them that he is immune from diplomatic 
uh, pressure, from condemnation, from sanction. The UN over the last two weeks has been, has been fumbling a security resolution that the language seems to suggest that they cannot condemn Haftar, they cannot pressure Haftar, they can't sanction him, when only seven months ago they sanctioned a small group from central Libya that went into Tripoli in September, and within 72 hours, that group and that individual, Salah Badi, was put on a sanctions list. Two weeks since Khalifa Haftar's offensive that has now resulted in at least 20,000 people that have been displaced with the use of grad missiles, which, are, which go against the Geneva Conventions and have, been, have struck in densely populated civilian areas. The UN is still unable to mention him by name in any of their statements, and I think that is the real danger here, that he enjoys this kind of diplomatic immunity from states that, on the surface, seem to suggest they support the UN-backed administration in Tripoli, but underneath have been providing discrete military and political support to Khalifa Haftar and now want to enjoy and, and, and immunize him from any kind of sanction. Enes, can you explain who Khalifa Haftar is, a Libyan-American? <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, we have to go back to 1969. I mean, he has a 50-year legacy of deception and defection. In 1969, he defected from the king of Libya to Muammar al-Gaddafi in the, in the coup of 1st of September 1969. He then defected again during the battle against Chad in 1986 to Hassan Hibri. He defected and went to Langley, Virginia, where he was alleged to have been working with the CIA for at least 20 years, and in the meantime joined the Libyan opposition led by Mohammed Mgadiyev in 1987. He defected from him and joined another Libyan opposition in 1992 led by Brick Swissy, who was the former Libyan ambassador to the Netherlands. He then defected from him and went, and back, went back to Gaddafi and reconciled in Cairo in 2004, but then again reneged on that and defected from Gaddafi in 2011 to join the revolution, which he didn't last very long in. He actually bombed the first elected parliament that, that came from the revolution in 2014, launched two coups in the space of three months in 2014, and in the latest deal that has been negotiated by the UN over two years since the first meeting between Khalifa Haftar and the UN-backed uh, prime minister in, in Abu Dhabi in May 2016, again in Paris in 2017, we were working towards a political solution. He reneged on that last deal in front of the UN chief. So, effectively, this is the most distrustful, untrustworthy character in the last 50 years in Libya's political history. He's like Pinocchio, but with more strings. I mean, he literally has more strings than you can count from at least seven states over the last 50 years. And my, my belief at the moment is that many people in Libya are now asking themselves, how do you bring someone like this with that kind of checkered history to a negotiation table and expect him to agree to anything and to expect him to kind of live up to his expectations? But if that's true of his, his long and checkered history, why has the opposition in Tripoli been uh, so unable to uh, uh, amass a sufficient support to, uh, to defeat him. Uh, could you talk about the problems within the so-called U.N.-sanctioned coalition government in Tripoli? So the U.N.-backed government is effectively a civilian-appointed government by the U.N. It was designed to not represent any of uh, Haftar's opponents. They only came into opposition to him around a few weeks ago when he launched this offensive against them. And in the words of Prime Minister Fayez Saraj, he said, I feel stabbed in the back the two days after the, the offensive was launched, many of whom have now, you know, had thought that he might have been a stabilizing uh, factor, but had engaged in good faith. But the groups, the armed groups on the ground that have emerged since 2011 are pluralistic. And I think in one, in one respect, Khalifa Haftar has tried to paint them as Islamists, as Salafi jihadist sympathizers. But that is just a dog whistle to the far right, to the emergence of populists in, 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 in Europe, in the West, that want to view the region in those terms, in black and white terms, to oversimplify and, and dangerously do so. But those groups that emerged in 2011 over a wide variety of different political uh, uh, trends and different political beliefs. But what coalesces and what unifies them, this conceptual thread, is that many of them, for a grievance and for other reasons over the last 42 years, do not want to return to military rule. Many of them are bound by a few things like the ideals of the revolution, the idea of social justice, accountability, pluralism, and many of them don't agree. Many of them, in fact, Many of them, in fact, have actually been working to try to um, uh, mask and use that grievance to mask their greed and to acquire um, um, financial interests and to try to acquire public uh, uh, rent-seeking uh, uh, behavior. But the underneath, the underlying truth in all this is that so many of those armed groups came into existence as extensions of their own tribes, their own cities, their own communities that had suffered under military rule and despised Gaddafi. But in a very simple sense, a lot of them didn't support the GNA. They might not have been ready to fight for the GNA, for the government of national accord, the UN-backed government, but they'd be willing to fight and die against uh, Khalifa Haftar in an attempt to stop and, uh, the return from, uh, of military rule.
And as, oh, we want to thank you for being with us, Ines Algamati, director of the Tripoli-based Sadek Institute, Libya's first independent research organization, speaking to us from London. When we come back in 30 seconds, uh, the ICC saying they won't go after uh, those um, uh, investigating the United States' involvement in war crimes in Afghanistan. Stay with us.